the name of our risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I bid you a warm welcome to this time of worship here at Columbia United Methodist Church. I am Pastor Mar Bruner, and we are absolutely delighted to have you worshiping with us today. You are absolutely welcome anytime. Today, we will conclude our service with communion, so if you want to gather communion elements to be able to participate, please do so. Um, you can have water or juice and some form of, of bread, a cracker or whatever you have handy, so that you can also participate in the Lord's Supper. Today we remember always that Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. And we have been called, friends, to live the resurrection here and now, and to spread the good news of Jesus Christ far and wide. Because of what God did on Easter, heaven and earth will never be the same. Rejoice and be glad. And now, friends, please join me for our opening prayer. Risen Messiah, hallelujah. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Glory be to you whom death could not defeat. Praise to the Savior of heaven and earth. Honor and glory are yours now and forever. Christ our Savior and Redeemer. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning is from the Psalms. We will read from chapter 118, verse 17, and verse 21 through 24. I won't die. No, I will live and declare what the Lord has done. I thank you because you answered me, because you were my saving help. The stone rejected by the builders is now the main foundation stone. This has happened because of the Lord. It is astounding in our sight. This is the day the Lord acted. We will rejoice and be glad in it. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Since sin and death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead has also come through a human being. We know that God shows no partiality, but welcomes and forgives all those who repent and believe, trusting in the promise of God let us confess our sins together. Please speak the words of the confessional prayer with me. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. But Christ suffered and died for us, was raised from the dead, and ascended on high for us, and continues to intercede for us. Believe the good news. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are all forgiven. Glory be to God. Amen.
Easter little disciples, do you know how to greet somebody on Easter Sunday? Oh, you say, he is risen, and then the person who replies to you says, he is risen indeed. And if you really want to, you can shout your loud, Alleluia! Oh, I think you should shout it now. Shout loudly, Alleluia! Oh my goodness, it's the best day of the year to me. Oh, I like Easter even more than Christmas. Now, I was thinking a little bit about the things that make us think about Easter. And the thing that makes me think about Easter the very most is Easter eggs. This time of year, we see Easter egg hunts everywhere. We see the Easter eggs in the stores and in Easter baskets and everywhere. And it's something that really symbolizes Easter. But I wonder, did you ever wonder why on earth we would use an egg to celebrate Easter? What in the world could an egg possibly have to do with Easter? Well, let's think of what an egg is for. This is a chicken egg, right? When a mother hen lays her egg, and we don't grab it to eat it, and she sits on it for weeks and weeks, well then, all of a sudden, after a few weeks, the eggshell cracks open, and what comes out of it? Yeah, a little chick. Oh, they're so cute and fluffy and yellow and soft. Oh, I love baby chicks. But that's why we have eggs at Easter, because they remind us of new life. Because inside of this egg, if the mother hen sits on it, there is a new little life. And a little baby chicken will be born out of this egg eventually. Now at Easter, because Jesus was resurrected, that's a big word, right? Which means God raised him from the tomb. And Jesus is alive and alive forever. That means that we celebrate the new life that we get to have in Jesus. It's pretty cool. Now today, I brought something extra special. Remember I said this is my chicken egg? I think we should open this egg and see what's inside. What do you think? What is inside an egg? Have you ever opened an egg before? I'm sure you've seen it, or at least maybe you've done it yourself too. Let's see if this egg has inside what we expect. So I'm going to break it. Oh, I got it open. Let's break it open. Oh my goodness, look. This is a real Easter egg. And do you know why I say it's a real Easter egg? Because it's just as empty as Jesus' tomb. Early in the morning when the women went to the tomb, they found the stone rolled away and they found it empty. Jesus wasn't there. And they thought, well, where could Jesus be? And suddenly two angels appeared to them and said, well, of course he isn't here. Jesus is alive and he will be alive forevermore. He has been resurrected. God brought him back. He is alive and because he lives, we will live too. Because he lives, we have new life in him. And that is the best news of Easter. That is the good news of Easter. So friends, alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Will you pray with me? Dear Lord, today we celebrate the empty tomb that when the women got there, it was empty because death would never win over your son. We thank you that Jesus is not in the grave, but that he is alive forevermore and that because he lives, we can live too. Help us to embrace the new life that you give us and to be the people you created us to be. Easter people every day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Happy Easter, friends. On this Easter morning, I would like for us to pray together for our world, for our church, for one another, for those who struggle and everyone in between. Let us go before the Lord in prayer. My Lord, what a morning. We gather joyfully to shout our alleluias and to declare that you are risen. You are risen indeed. But let us also remember what led us to this celebration. The many ways that we fall short of the incredible and boundless grace of God through sins of commission and sins of omission. It was our failure to love God and neighbor as we should that led to the cross and the tomb from which you arose victorious. On this day, precious Lord, we come before you in gratitude for being called your Easter people, who know that sin and death is not the end, but that you have promised us life in abundance. Before we call, you answer, O Lord. 
Before we even speak, you know our words. But as we pray this day, we pray that you will hear us. We pray for your church in the world. Give us, as your people, your body in this world, the courage to spread the good news far and wide, as those first women did at your tomb. Make us a welcoming place where all your precious children may find a home. Send us out into the world as your hands and feet. We pray for the citizens of the world in our own nation. Lord, show us the ways of peace for the sake of those with whom we share this life. Make us bringers of your justice and mercy to ease the suffering of so many. Open our hearts and our minds to love as you love, so that the kingdom of heaven may be visible here and now to all people everywhere. We pray this day for all those who suffer, for those who are ill, for those who care for loved ones, for those who are bent low under the burdens of life. We pray for those who give their life and time for the health and safety of others. We pray for those who work tirelessly to educate our youth and children, for those who do the difficult work of caring for those who cannot care for themselves. We pray for those who feel forgotten and cast aside by the world. Lord, bring peace to the afflicted, healing to the sick, and comfort to the brokenhearted. Lord, place in us a clean, living, beating heart that longs for you and for the things of God. Give us new life and make us into the people you created us to be, so that in all we do, in all that we are, we bear a living and bold witness to the one in whose name we gather, Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and Savior. Amen. Our good news this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke. We are reading from chapter 24, verses 1 through 12, and this is the Common English Bible. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, the women went to the tomb, bringing the fragrant spices they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. They didn't know what to make of this. Suddenly, two men were standing beside them in gleaming bright clothing. The women were frightened and bowed their faces toward the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He isn't here, but he has been raised. Remember what he told you while he was still in Galilee, that the human man must be handed over to sinners, be crucified, and on the third day, rise again. Then they remembered his words. When they returned from the tomb, they reported all these things to the eleven and all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. Their words struck the apostles as nonsense, and they didn't believe the women. But Peter ran to the tomb. When he bent over to look inside, he saw only the linen cloth. Then he returned home, wondering what had happened. The story of God for the covenant people of God. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. Living God, by your Holy Spirit, open our eyes to see the new light of this day. Open our lips to tell of the empty tomb. Open our hearts to believe the good news through Jesus Christ, our Lord. May your word come through me or in spite of me. Amen. It was very, very early in the morning. And in the pre-dawn darkness of the first day of the week, a small group of women carefully made their way to the garden tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. Their arms are heavily laden with perfumed oils and fragrant spices, their hearts even heavier with the burden of sorrow and grief. Their leaden feet pick their way carefully over the uneven ground. Every step closer is a little harder to take than the last. 
The women fight to hold back the tears that threaten to spill from their eyes at any moment. There is no conversation. They have no words. And they huddle close to one another for the comfort of each other's presence. The task ahead is not one that they are looking forward to, but it would be the very last time that they could take care of their beloved teacher. One last time to ensure that they gave him the dignity now for his eternal rest that he was not afforded in his cruel and humiliating death. It would be one last time to gaze upon his beloved face, to remember the incredible journey that they had taken with him since their time together in Galilee. One last time. Friends, it's interesting because the first Easter morning was not greeted by joyful shouts of alleluia. No joyful celebration marked the beginning of this day. It was met reluctantly with heavy hearts and despair, for it seemed as though hope had died. The future seemed bleak and uncertain. As the women arrived at the tomb, having steeled themselves mentally, preparing very carefully for the very difficult task ahead, they look up to see that the stone was no longer covering the tomb. And as they look inside, there is nothing there but the shroud that Jesus' body had been hastily wrapped in. Where was Jesus? I imagine their initial thoughts were not good ones probably thinking something along the lines of, oh great, what now? Has someone actually stolen Jesus' body to do God knows what with? How could things possibly get any worse than they already were? And somehow they did. And suddenly the good news breaks as the light of dawn creeps over the hill out of the corner of their eyes, they notice something bright and gleaming. It is not the sun, but instead, as they turn to look, they see two men in dazzling bright clothing standing beside them. Their reaction <laughs> at seeing this sight is no different than any of the people who have ever been visited by angels. I don't know that anyone ever said, oh, look, an angel. Most people are terrified when they are encountered with these divine messengers. So in their fear, they looked down at the ground. They refused to look at the men anymore. And they wondered what all this could mean. What could these men possibly be doing here? How things had come full circle in the story of Jesus Christ. Because once, a young girl was equally surprised and terrified by a divine messenger who came to tell her that the Messiah, God's own son would be coming into the world, and not just that, but she would be the one to bear him. She would be the one to act in the role of his human mother. Once, a group of dozing shepherds were terrified when their quiet skies were filled with the glory of an entire angelic host announcing the birth of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And now, once more, the angels are visiting yet another set of unlikely ones, the ones whom society would not grant a voice, those who are often at the periphery of the action. These women were as much disciples of Jesus Christ as the eleven, but of whom we don't really hear much except for in chapter 8 and then towards the end of chapter 23. We know that they are watching as the crucifixion is taking place, they, they followed Joseph as he laid Jesus in the garden tomb, and then they went home to prepare the spices with which they would give Jesus a dignified burial. You know, God's ways are not our ways. And once more, God carefully chooses who will be the first to hear this good news? Who will be the witnesses that God sends out to tell everyone of what they had seen and heard? The last shall be first, and the first shall be last. This message that the angels deliver are beyond comprehension. It just absolutely seems impossible, but yet this is exactly what it is that makes it holy, that makes it something of God, because there is no way that what was happening was something we could ever recreate. This was something only God could do. Why do you look for the living among the dead, they say. He isn't here. 
but he has been raised. Could it be? The angels continue, remember what he told you while he was still in Galilee, that the human one must be handed over to sinners, be crucified, and on the third day rise again. And then they did remember his words. They remembered what he had said on several occasions and what had not made sense to them then suddenly became absolutely clear. Jesus lives. Jesus is not dead, but God has raised him from the dead. Hope lives. Love lives. The kingdom lives. In this very moment, the absence of Jesus' body is the best news ever. Because if he is not here, then he lives, and he is still with us. And God's plan for saving the world through him has not been thwarted after all. Alleluia! Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. When every one of Jesus' friends seemed to desert him in his last days, when Judas betrayed him, when Peter denied knowing him, and when the other disciples stood at a fearful distance, afraid to intervene or even to let anybody know they were Acquainted with him in the first place, the women were there. They could not do anything to stop what was happening. And they watched in horror as the unthinkable happened and their beloved Lord was nailed to a cross among criminals. They watched as the world went dark for three hours until, in the middle of the day that is, until Jesus breathed his last. They watched as Jesus was hastily laid in a tomb that belonged to another so that they could have him safely buried before sunset on the beginning of Sabbath. And as the stone was rolled before the entrance, it seemed that the light had gone out of the world for good. Maybe the sun might never shine again. But the women went home, and they quickly prepared the fragrant spices and perfumed oils with which they could you know, anoint his body. They couldn't do anything to stop what had happened, but they could do this, this one last thing, this special thing. They could love him, and they could care for him one last time, just as they did while he was alive. They had not remembered at that point yet that what Jesus had said about being raised on the third day would mean that he would not actually be in the tomb. And frankly, neither had anyone else. Because if they had, every last disciple of Jesus' would be sitting in front of that stone the first thing after the Sabbath, waiting for that um, stone to roll away and Jesus to emerge. They would have been there to welcome him back because they would have remembered, but they did not. But now these women remembered. And their hearts and their feet felt light and bright as they ran back to the other disciples to share this incredible good news that Jesus is alive. Luke takes care to name the women. There was Mary Magdalene, the one who loved to sit at Jesus' feet as he taught. She first met Jesus, um, we are told in Luke 8 verse 2, that she first met Jesus because he drove seven demons out of her. Then there was Joanna. She was the wife of Herod's servant, Chusa. There was Mary, the mother of James. There was also Susanna, even though she was not mentioned here, but she might have been there too. She followed Jesus also. And then there were several other women who are not named. Maybe among them was the woman who came into the Pharisee's house when Jesus was invited there to eat in chapter 7. The woman who washed his feet with her own tears and then dried it with her hair, who covered his feet with kisses and then anointed it with fragrant oil. She forgives salvation and forgiveness because of her faith that day when no one else would let her be any other than a terrible sinner. These women had all experienced Jesus' presence in their lives in profound ways, and they had seen his miracles and his teaching. They had listened to everything that he was telling people. They had seen him heal people. They shared in fellowship and meals with Jesus and with the other disciples, as well as with sinners and tax collectors, the poor and the outcast. They remembered everything, every parable, every story. They remembered 
how Jesus had that special way of drawing people together with love and hope and grace and mercy into this new kind of community, this new vision of what a community could look like, a community made up of all kinds of people. They remembered how he tended to look at people in ways that no one else did. And in remembering, they cannot help but share this with other people. He is not here in this tomb. He is alive. He lives, and so shall we. It seems so odd, doesn't it, that the male disciples who know all the same things, who were told all the same things, do not receive this news with greater joy. In fact, they think that the women are rambling, that they're just kind of, you know, talking nonsense, not making any sense. I mean, they should have believed these women. They were part of the inner circle. They were as disciples of Jesus and had been with him for as long as they had. They were telling of something they had actually seen and heard. And because they had gone in a group, there were several others to corroborate the story. These were trusty and faithful followers of Jesus, and yet not one person believed them. But they faithfully continued to bear their witness and tell their truth. Peter decides to go see for himself. He runs to the tomb to see what the women are on about, and he sees the empty tomb. He sees the linen cloth, but it does not help them to believe their story. In fact, we are told he returned wondering what had happened. So how is it that the story then finally made it to all of us to hear today? How did we finally come to believe? Well, it began with the women's faithful witness. Because they continued to tell their truth about what they had seen. And then, as others began to encounter the risen Christ in person, they remembered what the women had said, and they believed too. Today, we read of the faithful testimony of those who had experienced the risen Christ personally, and we believe. I want us to just for a moment return to the message of the angels that they gave to the women that day in the garden. When they asked the women why they would look for the living among the dead, it struck me that we still do exactly the same thing. We tend to look for Jesus in the relics of the past, holding fast to what is comfortable and familiar, to things that are long dead and no longer working, instead of embracing the new thing that God continues to do among us. It is only when we connect to the living, breathing Jesus who is still walking among us today that we, when we remember everything that, we, that he taught us, all that he did, all the meals and fellowship and healing and parables, when we remember his death at the hands of sinners, sinners like us, by the way, that we can fully accept the invitation of the resurrection to live as Jesus lived, to walk as he walked, and to love as he loved. In a living world where hope is alive and love has conquered all. We are called to continue the work that he has started. And we will continue to find him, not in the relics of the past, but in the faces of the people we encounter as we strive to be his faithful disciples in this world. I also think about the fact that they said he was handed over to sinners. He was indeed handed over to sinners. And not just on the night of his betrayal, but this happened at the moment he drew his first breath in Bethlehem as a tiny baby. Then and now, in the hands of people who do not always do the right things, who do not get it right all the time. God trusted the world with God's only son, and we killed him. But even then, sin and death would not win, for nothing can separate us from God's love in Jesus Christ our Lord. Not death or life, not angels or rulers, not present things or future things, not powers or height or depth or any other thing that is created. This is Paul's words from Romans 8, verse 38 and 39. Nothing can separate us from God's love for us in Jesus Christ, not even our own brokenness. This world needs hope. And on this Easter Sunday, we are firmly reminded once more of the hope and joy of life in Christ. He lives and so shall we. 
God is with us, working and active. Death does not get the final word. Sin is not the end of the story. The kingdom is here, and life and joy and love wins out over hate and evil. Who will we tell? Will we tell even if no one believes us? Let us remember who and whose we are because of what God did on Easter. God so loved the world then, and God so loves the world now that we have been given the living, breathing Jesus to help us to spread the good news to every corner of it so that salvation and life and love may reign. Amen. Christ our Lord invites to his table all those who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, and who seek to live in peace with one another. Having made our humble confession, let us draw near in faith and prepare to receive this holy sacrament. I want to remind you that this is the Lord's table. This is not the table of this church or of any church, but it is the table of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in that way, all are invited to this table. All are welcome to participate in the sacrament of Holy Communion. Today, I remind you that the Lord is with you. Please lift up your hearts and let us give our thanks and praise to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and brought us to a land flowing with milk and honey, and set before us a new way of life. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. By your great mercy, we have been born anew to a new and living hope through the resurrection of your Son from the dead and to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Once we were no people, but now we are your own people, declaring your wonderful deeds in Christ, who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, he gave thanks to you, he broke the bread, he gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you. He gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and li living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. 
By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now, let us pray with the confidence of children of God the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, take the bread that you have prepared, and as you eat it, this is the body of Christ which is given for you. Amen. Take the juice that you have prepared, and as you drink it, remember, this is the blood of Christ, which is given for you. Amen. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give of ourselves for others in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends, go with joy to tell the good news. Alleluia! Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Lord, grant that we have what has been said with our lips, we may embrace and believe in our hearts, and that what we believe in our hearts, we may live out in our daily lives. Through Jesus Christ, our risen Savior, amen and amen. Happy Easter, everyone. God be with you until we meet again. <laughs>